I see feminism as a social pathology, as it seeks to blame all men as oppressors of all women. Feminism is a deviant movement that not only demonizes men, but also seeks to destroy the family, which is the basis of all civilizations. Feminism is and has been harmful to society and transgresses against one of the most fundamental human rights, in this case, the right of all men to be deemed innocent till proven guilty. Feminism decrees that all men are born guilty. Now, I think there's many of you in this room who will resonate to that because of this ridiculous argument that is actually inarguable. There's no such thing as patriarchy. It is simply a word as matriarchy, and it has been used to demonize and destroy. And this is the beginning of what I need to say to you. We have to get on the same principle about this. If you think about it, so it would have been about 1969 when women in America had decided that they wished a women's movement to be created that would exclude men. And it was a very simple branding. Instead of capitalism, where men and women work together to create a different and better world, what they decided to do is move the goalposts. So it now become patriarchy. That means all men. And then the branding was that all men born with a Y chromosome, therefore, are violent, battering rapists, and you know the fallout from that concept. However, it was a brilliant fundraising exercise, and you have to remember this. This is not women who care at all for other women. This is women who are business women, and they are set to create probably one of the biggest fraudulent movements history has ever seen. I have been trying in vain, talking to historians from all over the world, to ask them if there has ever been a time in the history of this world where women have turned on their men to such an extent that you now do not have human rights. Men living with women at any point can be suddenly excluded. They can be falsely accused of rape, whether they're married or not. They can be falsely accused of domestic violence, whether they're violent or not. They can be barred from their children because they're also potentially pedophiles. So when I look at this scenario, and it's been 45 years, the first time I really had some hope was when I went to that first international conference, Paul Elam, in Detroit. And even though it had been a threatened conference with, with the usual threats and bomb scares, they had moved the venue and their people for the first time gathered nervously together to actually begin to talk about the emerging men's rights movement. It's been a long time before men have come together to take care of each other. It's extraordinary how men will die for their families, they'll die for their children, they'll die for their country. But when it comes to being personally attacked within their own home, they have no voice and they don't know how to deal with the emotional issues because it is so catastrophic. To be a man who considers himself happily married, to come home one night, and this is how the Canadian men see it, and the house is empty and the children are gone. He has no right to know where his wife and children have gone. The police will just say they're in a place of safety, which means a refuge. Secondly, once she's in a refuge, she'll be encouraged to think of domestic violence as a fast track to divorce. If that isn't fast enough, it's what they call the silver bullet. He is then accused by his partner or wife of molesting the children. From the moment a man stands accused, he has no human rights. All allegations across the Western world made against men, the victim or the so-called victim has to be believed. This is particularly germane here, where I know, and you will be hearing from Mark Pearson, who this actually happened to. I know that the men are being pulled off the streets 
daily and accused by women. Now, if a man is accused by a woman, she's seen as a victim, and she will be anonymous for the rest of her life, even if the man is acquitted. Can you imagine that happening? Majority of public have no idea what's going on because these things are done in secret. I need to go back to start and explain to you that when I opened the refuge, I was very aware of the violence of women because my mother was extremely violent, particularly to me, because I looked like my father. She was also one of the possibly the most brilliant alienators you could come across. Yes, my father raged. Yes, he would come from a very violent family. He didn't hit anybody. He, he certainly terrorized us. He certainly controlled us. But as I grew older, I realized part of his controlling was his fear. He was a fearful, frightened, battered child who had never managed to put, to transcend his background. But he was brilliant. He was a genius. But he was married to a cold, narcissistic exhibitionist who was only there for the lifestyle that he could offer her. One of the tragedies is that she kept him, and this will make sense to an awful lot of you sitting in this room, she kept him. She derided him, she belittled him, she was spiteful, she was permanently angry with him, she manipulated him, and she denied him any form of sex or affection. And this is how so many men have to live. For women, since the first refuge, there are about 500 refuges in this country. And if there's not refuges, there is provision for women and children the moment they need to leave. There is help offered everywhere, through police stations, through social services, through all sorts of agency. Nothing for men. How is it that governments in this country have allowed this to happen? We, I gather we have a member of parliament here today. Are you there? Is he there? Oh, well, he will be because he's speaking after me, so he's going to be here. But anyway, I do welcome him because this is the first time, as far as I know, anybody from Parliament has actually arrived to support male victims of violence. And I think it should be celebrated. The tragedy, as I could see it, was almost as soon as I opened the refuge for women, because I recognized that 62 of the women in the refuge out of the first 100 were themselves violent and in case, some cases more violent than the men. It's interesting because my study 45 years ago is now recognized worldwide because the figures prove, and it's not how many men hit women, it's not how many women hit men, but the figures prove it's virtually equal. And that makes sense because if you look at intergenerational family violence, which is I was talking about for those first four years and people were listening, I was talking to the mothers that came in, were violent to themselves, violent to their children, and violent to other people, and tracing back the generations of violence. And as the social workers would bring these women in and say, I don't know why you're bothering to take her in, she'll only go back. I was saying, we're not asking the right questions. So I believe from the very beginning that if you could sit a woman down, you could show her the history and the patterns, and then talk to her, about what she wanted for her children, she would stay. And it was right, she did stay. As did so many of the men, because men were welcome to come and talk to me any time. And that's when I wanted a men's house, an equal. And why? And I, I got the house, I got it for a peppercorn rent. Not one single man who supported my refuge and bought me houses for women and children would put a hand in their pocket for other men. And this is still the case. And this is something that men have to think deeply about. My feeling out of all this is that as this men's rights movement grow, with all of you sitting in this room as really the beginning of this movement, more and more people will listen because time and time again, the police know the truth. I've often talked to policemen and they say, yes, we have a list of families that we're called out to again and again and again, and the older policemen say, yes, and now we're dealing with their children. And I can trace the same pattern through the mothers coming through who now are in my age group, 70s, and then their children are in their 40s with their children. 
And I promise you, the therapeutic community that I developed, it's a very long term, because not only do they come into the crisis refuge with the children, they then can move and share with each other into what we call a second stage housing. And there in that second stage housing, they can stay as long as they need to. And this is a vital amount of work. But it's unless women and men are willing to work together, it's not going to change. The feminist movement is a billion dollar industry. Their influence has crept through every single institution in the Western world. They are enormously powerful. To the extent that we're now facing, if Theresa May comes in as our prime minister, she wear, wore a t-shirt which said, this is what feminist look, feminism looks like. That tells you where her heart is. If Andrea Ledsom comes in, she is somebody who is enormously interested in children and she understands generational family violence. The future for the changes that are needed to save men and children and women going into prisons and mental hospitals lie in understanding the early years. I would like to explain that when you hold a baby in your arms, you're holding the genetic package. Now we know that the brain is plastic. The baby's brain is not formed when it's born. We'd assumed it was. Thereafter, experience is the architect of the brain. So if you were born like I was into a toxic, violent family, your brain is wired up to become hyperactive, hypersensitive, and the part of the frontal lobe that where sits aggression is never going to be properly wired up because in the terrible twos and the tantrums that most children have, those families are throwing tantrums so the child never learns restraint. The work that we need to do is where somebody finds their violence, we don't jail them and punish them, we and help them recognize the patterns and learn other strategies for survival than being violent. As a child, I was extraordinarily violent. I wrote a book called Infernal Child because no one could deal with me. That was my strategy for violence, just to go out there and annihilate anybody who crossed me. My sister had the alternative, which is she was what I call a hibernator. When the violence and the screaming and the rage started, she would actually curl up in a ball. She ended up with asthmas and eczemas and migraines, all those stress symptoms, because she internalized, she imploded the violence. What I'm looking for is transcending, and that is part of the therapeutic community, where people learn to transcend their backgrounds, because we have choice. But what we do at the moment, and this is something that's becoming more and more apparent, actually, in the work that people are doing with children, how much more damaged the boys are, emotionally and physically, than the girls. The girls was, I noticed this in the refuge, so much more resilient. It didn't mean they didn't suffer equally, but they had more strategies for survival than the boys, particularly where the women, the mothers, were violent. And when I was told, well, look at the amount of men in jail, versus the amount of women. This just proves it. No, it doesn't. It just proves that in generational family violence, it is the boys that are most damaged by what's happening, particularly if the violence is coming from their mothers. My feeling is that because we now have MRI scans, because now the medical profession can actually look at babies' brains that are badly wired up, they can see. And this began with the, with the orphans from Romania, when families went over and brought these children back, and then were appalled as they realized that they couldn't control the children as they grew older. And that's where they started the MRI scans. Big studies now in place will show that the roots of violence lie and have always lain in generational family violence, that the whole feminist concept is fraudulent. They have been collecting money fraudulently, the money does not go to the refugees. And exactly the same as there's an organization called White Ribbon dot Canada dot America dot whatever. Those people, it has been proven and published that all the money that they collect stays to pay staff salaries, expenses, and PR. 
nothing gets to the refugees. So there's a massive, massive amount of money invested on keeping women as victims. The damaging part of victimizing everybody is that you disenable women and you encourage them to think of themselves as weak, unable to take responsibility for themselves, and this too becomes generational. In the refuge, when a mother would come in and say, he did this, he made me do that. No, you did it. You chose him. Yes, he's violent. He was always violent. It's your choice, your consequence. We are all responsible for the consequences of our actions. And you start from there. It doesn't mean that you don't comfort and understand suffering, but it means that the remedy for the suffering lies within you. But before we could ever have an, uh, a fair playing field, there has to be a recognition that men too are victims of violence. Yes, they can make bad choices. We all make bad choices. But it is not at all just or right that one part of the equation is considered to be worthy of care and respect and a treatment and the other part of the equation is ignored and demonized. We have come to a time in the history of the Western movement that having done its best, the feminist movement, to destroy the family, which on the big, big conferences that I used to go to when I was first interested in the feminist movement, and they were called collectives, we were told to call ourselves sisters, we were told to call ourselves in consciousness raising groups, which we did, I had one in my house, and <clears throat> I had a lot of history behind me, because my parents were sent to, to Sing, to Sing Tin Sin in 49, and they were captured by the communists, and they were kept under house arrest. And I, we were at, my sister and I were at school, and we didn't see them for three years. So I became an expert from experience of what actually happens in a communist country. And I would stand on those platforms when they women were standing there saying, the family is a dangerous place for women and children. The future of the family is single parent mothers. And what they didn't say at that time, it would be funded by the state, which it is across the Western world. And my feeling out of it all is what happened 45 years ago is now fortunately beginning to unravel. People are becoming more and more aware of this malignancy called the feminist movement, this destroyer of family, destroyer of relationships, and above all, destruction of children. And as you know now what is happening, it's happening, to, in a sense, it's backfired for women. That's the worrying part that the feminists aren't even acknowledging because they're in it for the money. The backfiring is where women are forced out to work whether they want to go or not. Because Cameron, our conservative prime minister, stated that he would give money to women who are working, 125,000, £125, pounds or something, I can't remember the exact date, but women who chose to stay at home would not get the grant because it was a chosen lifestyle. Since when? Did mothering or fathering your children become a chosen lifestyle? It's not a chosen lifestyle. It's the most important thing you will ever do in this world. To be part, whether you have children or not, but be part with loving, raising, normal, happy children. One of the tragedies, and I think we can see this today with what's been happening, as you probably all know, five Policemen uh, have been shot and many, many injured. And there is a very tangible feeling across America that this could spiral out of control. The roots of that go back to where the beginning of the slave trade, where families were split, men from women, women with, with children, and the men disenfranchised. In a sense, there is a form of slavery today. And men, again, are disenfranchised. They are born knowing that they are potentially dangerous. They're born shamed. They're shamed in school as boys. They're shamed at university. They have to attend lectures to be told how not to rape. 
I have women contacting me because in the primary schools, small boys are being accused of sexually abusing little girls. In one case, I'm thinking of what the child did is he'd come in and he tapped this little girl, who was his friend, on the bottom as he passed. Mother was called in. Potential, potential rapist. There has to be a change. And it is coming. I mean, that's the one thing I can say to you all. From that lone time when I used to stand by myself and get screamed at, here we are today. And I know that people like Paul and Mike, who's standing for Parliament, Paul, who is the father of this movement, are going to take it on. And all of you today are charged that this is something that we have to fight back. We cannot allow it to continue because there is no chance for our children or our grandchildren or my great-grandchildren. I have two boys, great-grandchildren, and I passionately care that they should have this... What was... I can't even think of a word to describe what it does to small boys to be told that they should be ashamed of themselves because they just behave like boys in school. Feminism, one day, will be seen for what it is, a huge scam, one of the biggest scams of the last century. And with that, I'm going to wait for questions. Good morning, Erin. Thank you for your provocative and thoughtful comments. Since you've already been provocative, would you like to comment on the relationship of feminism and fascism? Well, what it, what it was and always has been, it's an old-fashioned Marxist movement. And these were Marxist feminists. And yes, I mean, in, in a sense, do they behave like fascists? Yes because they have total control, absolutely total control, and they're heavily funded, and basically they have the power to destroy any man they want to. Because as they see women as the proletariat and men as the capitalist oppressors, uh, there is no hope in, for any kind of resolution for this. And the Marx, this is the ironic thing. The Marxist feminists have succeeded in doing what the communists could never do. The communists never actually managed to destroy the family, even though that was always their intention, as you know, from the Frankfurt School and Engels writing. The most important thing to do if you want to dominate a country is to disenfranchise men from the family because men will die for their families. Men will fight for their families. Men will disobey for their families. Take the man away from the family and it will disintegrate because the children of those families, as you can see, essentially have now become the, the, the people who fill our prisons. We know in England, and I'm sure it's true of everywhere else, that of the men in prisons, I think it was like last time I looked at a study, it's something like 73% are all children from violence-prone homes and without fathers. Fatherless boys and girls are damaged. It should be the birthright for every child to be born in to a loving, warm, wanted home with their biological father and mother. Yes, there are other arrangements. Yes, I have been a single parent mother, but I can tell you from trying to bring up a boy as a single parent mother, the father is equally necessary, particularly as the boys go older. But we deprive boys of men. We deprive them in our schools. We deprive them right the way through to universities, where now, as you all know, the universities are the hotbed for creating feminism. Does that answer your question? Uh, Aaron, as you um, have a lot of interface with government in the UK, I'd like to ask you what you anticipate the state's reaction to the feminist movement would be and what the feminist reaction would also be to a potential sovereign debt crisis that takes away the funding from the state, which can no longer finance itself. I think 
that is, this is actually happening here. Um, many of the, you have to remember that the refugees themselves survive on money coming from the government and money coming from the local borough councils mostly. Because the majority of the money that goes into any of the feminist movements, uh, like, the, is, it, is it two billion going into Violence Against Women Act, Paul? 660 million annually. <laughs> yeah, that's what's going, but that doesn't get to the refugees. You see, I'm concerned because these, that part of the, the feminist movement, the refugees are closing, and in America, because the local funding is going. But the actual funding that's going in for the movement, which is the, the money pot, the honey pot, actually probably will remain because the government of all the Western countries are terrified of losing women's votes. And they quite wrongly think that women will vote for them. But as we turn the tide, as it becomes more and more obvious that the whole concept of men as patriarchal, violent people will fade, then hopefully that funding will go, but not till then. The refugees will go first, which is the tragedy, really. We have one more here. Janet? Good morning, Erin. You have described girls as being more resilient in the face of domestic violence because they have better strategies for survival. Could you describe for us what those survival strategies are and how they're different from the ones that boys deploy? Difficult one, but this is only me, and, and I'm, I'm, in a sense, I'm not an expert. What I am is somebody who's had a huge amount of hands-on experience, if you like. You know, uh, and what I noticed, and I've always thought of this, it's, it's a strange thing to share with you. What I could see with the girls, first of all, their ability to communicate with each other over their feelings. There was a natural uh, ability to, 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 to share pain and sorrow and private suffering with each other. The boys didn't do that. The girls are born knowing that they have choices. And the choice that they have is they can bear, bring up other children They've always had the choice that they can be supported since our welfare state, whether they choose to be in a relationship or not. They have an income and a lifestyle. Now, I've always looked at boys and thought, boys are born into a world where they have to make themselves up. They have no fallback. Boys are vulnerable in that they have to grow up to be something, which actually, interestingly enough, brings me to the whole concept of one of the things the radical feminist movement has done is to make men question why they should be born into a form of servitude. It has been completely accepted by men for generations that they must die, they must serve, they must have a family, and they must actually work to keep that family for as long as they live. What's now happening with movements like MGTOW, which you probably all know about, men going their own way. These are men who are looking at the situation and saying, no, they're opting out. There are a lot of young men living together in flats in, in England who essentially have just said, enough's enough. No, we're not going to have this top job in the city and work 24-7 to create these incredible material lifestyles for our women and children. We are going to say no to that. No more are men going to be wage slaves. See, the feminists complained that, that they were house slaves. And I always looked at that and thought, God, if I've got to choose to be a slave, I'd rather be a house slave than a wage slave. <laughs> well, now women are both. So who has this movement benefited? I'm saying that with a sense of humor because I have to, because otherwise, I don't know how I could survive because the damage that has been done is so catastrophic. And that's the comfort of being here with you because you do realize how catastrophic and how lonely it is to be out there when if you said something like that, the people standing around you would probably call for men in white coats. <laughs> they would. But we have to educate. That's the most important thing we can do is to educate to spread what we're having to say. 
and above all, to learn to love each other. Because for men, so many, and this is, breaks my heart, commit suicide. Because what happens is they lose the love that they poured into their family and their children. And one of the biggest forms of suicide or reasons for suicide is the fact that they are suddenly kicked out of their lives and left with absolutely nothing. A lot of us will know Earl as an example. And daily, as we're sitting here, men are killing themselves and no government is doing anything about it. Um, Cats, Holly? Yeah. Hi, Erin. I'm, I'm a journalist from the Mail Online. I feel like I should probably say that, just so you know, though. Um, okay. my, my comments are not sort of personal. Um, but I was, I was interested in what you had said about um, women choosing violent partners and having to take responsibility for that. Um, but I want, I wondered if maybe you sounded a little bit more compassionate towards men who end up in prison for, for pretty much the same problem of having grown up in a maybe a violent home um, and been deprived and neglected throughout their own childhood, which I think is what leads women to um, be involved with violent partners. Um, and um, I just wondered whether that was whether I got that right or not. You seemed a little bit more to have a bit more compassion, maybe for the men who have um, who are penalised basically for, for, for their, their behaviour, which is a symptom of of a, a traumatic childhood. Oh no, because women equally are victims of traumatic childhood, just as I was. But the argument is that when a woman came in and would say to me, "He did this and he did that," and I would say. Yes, he did do that. Yes, he, he has always been violent. Maybe you found out too late. But until you take responsibility, I'd say the same to men, because men equally get involved with violent women. Until you take responsibility for yourself and start looking at the patterns of why you made that choice. You see, it is for those of us who've come from dysfunctional and toxic families, we don't see warning signs It's because it's what we know. And one of the things that we all tend to do, men and women, who are equally vulnerable, is you see the potential inside this man. I'm talking about women now. You, a woman will see the potential inside this man, and she will see the hurt child, and she will go in with the intention of helping that hurt child. And a lot of women, I've had to say to them, you have to think of your partner as your oldest child, and one of the things that you're not, you can't bear is the fact you're leaving on, him on the highway crying for you. And that's, you feel you need to go back and mend him. Have you ever thought that the child inside that man is dead and you're carrying the corpse? And that is true. And sometimes a woman, particularly if the violence has been, when I talk about domestic violence, I talk about Women coming in with broken bones, cigarette burns, all the rest of the terrible, terrible physical violence. But again, I will say that often I have said to a woman, you're better off if you've got a bruise, because at least everybody can see what's happened, because the bruises will fade, the bones will heal, but the words never go away. And might not, I'm equally, equally compassionate to both sides, because why wouldn't you be? All of you in England cried when you read stories of Baby P. This is one of our, uh, our small two and a half, three year old boy for the American audience, who, which happens in America daily, who was horribly abused by his mother and by her partner. And he died under terrible circumstances and the country wept. And there were yet more, more in, in the end of that argument is this. So you cried now. What happens when he becomes the monster he was set up to be, or she becomes the monster? Then you hate her. Then you imprison her, and you imprison him. I'm asking for intervention from the very beginning. Education in schools about how brains are formed, the responsibility of parenting, understanding that it is what you do in those early years. In the pregnancy, for instance, women would come in pregnant, the baby not moving, be worried. And I'd say, baby shares your cigarette smoke, shares your drink, shares your chemicals of rage and fear. So babies are born 
wired up and damaged. That's where we have to start. Not at the end result, which is the prisons and the mental hospitals, which have no interest in rehabilitating anybody. Does that answer it? Yeah, it does. Um, can I just ask as well, um, I, you said at the very beginning that domestic violence isn't a gender issue. What, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Because obviously there are differences, aren't there, between men and women and the way that a man perpetrates violence against a woman is... No. One woman said... Well, remember, we were talking about this in the refuge, and as I said, of the first 162 of the women were more violent than the men they left, which figure actually holds up in international research. More women are violent to men in, in personal relationships than the other way around. But that isn't... We shouldn't be counting. We should be looking at backgrounds and why it happened. And uh, I remember one woman saying to me, well, Erin, you see, weapons are a great leveller. And she was the one, actually, that showed me how to bottle. You take a bottle and you smash it, and you put it in a man's face and you turn it. Yes. And uh, I believe, believe you me, it's, it's both men and women can be equally violent. Equally. The problem is this. We acknowledge, and men acknowledge, evil in themselves. Men don't allow women, and it's condescending not to allow us to be fully human. We can be as evil, as good, as warm, as loving, all those things. So we should be equal. That's what is equality to me, that you and I actually share the same abilities as the men sitting in here to be able to, not only heroic, but also violent. And by creating this vacuum where all women are innocent victims. You are not allowing women their human rights, as far as I'm concerned. Erin, um, thank you very much. Um, we, we have a very tight timetable, so I'm afraid we have to end the Q&A there. Uh, gentlemen and ladies, Erin Pitsy.